Okay, welcome to Bounce Around Charleston. I'm Reverend Randolph Miller, and today we have a wonderful show lined up for you. My first guest is Mr. Alfonso Brown. You will know him because of the Gullah Tours. Mr. Alfonso Brown, welcome to Bounce Around Charleston. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, it's been stated that I don't know how true it is that you're retiring from the business and you're writing books and you're just doing a whole lot of stuff. Tell us about that. Well, just 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 one book. In other words, I um when I got my license to become a tour guide, I did a lot of research and on the history of Charleston, Black history of Charleston and everything. And I'm a member of Mount Zion AME Church on Glebe Street. And um, we used to, we had, we had, we had used to have um, two services, 7.30 and 11 o'clock. Most of the senior citizens were, would come to the 7.30 service. And of course they knew I was a tour guide and I want to know a lot about Charleston and Black history. And they gave it to me. They, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Sarah Darling, who worked at Jenkins Orphanage most of her life, and the late Ms. Thelma Sumter, uh, she was a musician in Charlton, told us a lot, told a lot. Ms. Sumter told me that her, her father, Clarence Brown, was the first black deputy inspector of customs at the custom house. And then, uh, uh, um, this lady named Ms. Uh, Julia Pope, she was a librarian in the school system, told me that Lena Horn was John T. Calhoun's great, great grandniece. Mm -hmm. things, things like that over and over. So most of my time in Mount Zion at the breakfast table after 7th of the service was spent with me writing, telling, writing all the things they tell me. So <laughs> I took all that information that I planned for my tour route and put it on a book, you know, put it on a, on a just wrote it down. So when a co-worker at the library at, the, at Rivers where I work told me, well, now what are you gonna do with all that stuff? I said, I don't know, I'm just having when I need them. So you want to put it in the book. That's right. And that's the, that's what we did. I wrote a little book, a little homemade book. Then uh Arcadia Press at that time it was another company called another company, asked me if they can do my book for me. I said, Yeah, I, I, I'm a procrastinator. How are you gonna get it all done? <laughs> said, well, we put it in a contract, and that was it. Well, that's wonderful. Well, okay, so that's how your touring started. So, okay, let's 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 back up a second. Mm -hmm. This part about Gullah. What is Gullah? Gullah is a language. Gullah was recognized as a language ever since 1939. That's been a world-renowned linguist, a black man named Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, taught at Howard University for many years. Did a lot of summer teaching at our South Carolina State University, South Carolina State College at that, at that time. When he was in South Carolina, he came across students from the low country, heard them talking. He understood <laughs> what they were saying. He was a linguist. And so um, he always knew about Gullah, but never accepted all the different other explanations other people gave to it. Did his own investigation, traveled up and down the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, interviewed the people, stayed with them, worshiped the people, um, went out to Sierra Leone's West Africa. When he got to Sierra Leone's, he realized that the same thing they were speaking in Sierra Leone, speaking in Jordan, in the low country. <laughs> but he presented this finding to the American Linguist Association. And that's when it was dubbed as a language, but nobody ever told us anything about it. They just made us think that we were speaking bad English. But bad wow. English, bad English and Gullah is Gullah. So tell me something. So when you do your tour guides, you are telling the people about the Black history of Charleston? It focuses more, of course, not exclusively on the Black site and history of Charleston, but not, not exclusively. Okay. So tell us, tell us some of the areas where you take your tour guides. Well, I'll start off with the highlight first, but that most tourists say they like the most, is the stop at Philip Simmons' house. Ms. Simmons is a world-renowned ornamental gate maker, has ironworks all over the world. And before he passed, uh, I would always stop. I still go to my house. But before he passed, I would tell people all through the tour about Philip Simmons, so, so, so the gate that they made. And when I got to his house, I would say, that's his house, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, would you like to meet him? And they were, I was, bulge out, do you mean meet him? He's still living? I never said whether he was living or dead. <laughs> and 
And so that, I mean, people cried in the presence of Mr. Philip Simmons. That's one of the most, that's one of the highlights of the tour. Another highlight of the tour, I think is uh, behind Bethel United Methodist Church, where Bethel United Methodist at the corner of Pitt and Calhoun is the only white congregation in the city of Charleston that I know of that still that maintain a full graveyard on the site for its slaves and free blacks. Mm. And they still have the tombstones against the wall and, and uh, behind Bethel graveyard. And people find that very, very interesting there. Uh, so of so many other sites. Uh, and and uh, when I get on the battery, I talk about the Civil War and how to ask people, ask the tourists, I said, uh, who knows where the war ended? Of course, no one seemed to know that, you know, where the war ended. Well, first of all, ask them who would, who knew, if they knew that the war started in Charleston, in the Civil War, and most of them do. And they, they did know that started in Charleston. They, very few knew where it ended. You know, I tell them it ended at Appomattox, Virginia, but because most people don't know that, it's because around and they, and, and, and General Lee surrendered it to Donald Grant at the courthouse at Appomattox, Virginia. And um, General Lee was defeated, the reason being, that nobody tell, talk about is that General Lee was defeated by the first South Carolina Black Regiment. But during the 1900, 1899, the daughters of the Confederacy edited most all of that stuff out of the history books. You know, who in the right mind gonna tell you that the war started over slavery and was ended by slaves? Mm. So they, 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 they are impressed by that bit of information. Oh, so many sites, I try to make it full of, like the world feel very meaty as I possibly can to make it last in their minds. Now, this thing about, um, what was that uh, musical Porgy and Bess? Was that really a part of this area? The, uh, the storyline is fiction, but the lifestyle is true. For the first time ever in 1970, that the Gershwin Foundation allowed an all amateur cast to produce it, to do Bruce Park and Bass. It was one of the most amazing productions ever produced. And um, I've seen it sometimes afterwards, but I never could enjoy it because there's never was the same as it was when it was done in Charleston. In Charleston, were, you were talking to the people, in other words, the people that Gershwin place in this opera or uh, had to produce and it's the star in the opera, the characters, in other words, were the same people that were on the stage that produced it in 1970. You know, not the same people, but relatives, descendants of the same people. They lived that lifestyle and they and no one could, could portray it better than, than what we did in 1970. Wow. So now um, there's somewhere off Broad Street there's an area that's also part of that 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 uh, that storyline. What area is that? But Church Street, Church near Broad, is with is with the inspiration setting of George Gershwin. In the located, you know, blacks live all down there together, all downtown Charleston together, and Catfish Row was just about oh a stone throw away from where George um, Dubois Haywood, who wrote the book Porgy. He and his wife Dorothy, where they lived, and so, 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 um, he had a very good, uh, he had everything right, and all of the information right there to write about. He could write downstairs, right there next to him, and so there really was a porgy. He got around town in a car drawn by goat. There was a bass. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, during the 1970 production of Porgy and Bess, we found the lady who was Bess. Uh, her real, her real name was, um, Oh, I can't think of it right now. It'll come to me. But she lived on lived in Rom on Romney Street. But mm. she didn't want to have anything to do with it. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. Sal, let me see. I can't tell. It'll come to me. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. They because they tried to interview her, interview her. But she said no. Because see, Porgy was such a mean and vicious person. No one really liked Porgy. Mm. And so um Porgy tried, killed about three or four men during his lifetime. <laughs> and last person tried. Maggie Barnes, that's her name. Maggie Barnes, that's the last person Porgy tried to kill. Um, who was her last, who was her girlfriend, lived out on Romney Street. 
And so um tried to kill Maggie because he thought that Maggie had stolen a watch from him. <laughs> so, you know, he was, his, I, that was that I was in a, I was in a lecture with many of his family members lived on um, James Island. And they said, oh yeah, he was being and vicious. When we heard him coming, when we see him coming, we'll lock the door, don't let him come in. Wow. Yeah. So, so apparently you have enjoyed traveling through Charleston, telling the story of what- Every happened. moment, every day, every hour, I enjoyed every moment. It was so exciting. Charleston is a very, no wonder it was voted number one tourist destination in the world by Condonese Magazine. Seven times. One time, France came in second over Jonathan. So how can people get in contact with you to do the tours and find out what the Black history is all about in this area? Well, I have a webpage, gullatours.com. They go to my webpage. You can find out many information about the tour, different places that I show. You know, on the on webpage, it has on a few, few of the many places that I cover. And the book can be purchased at the Visitor Center. Charlton Museum, um, all over the, all over Charlton, Amazon.com, my webpage, Gullitude.com, every, every major book tour in, in, in the world. So you're not retiring from this job, are you? <laughs> I want to try. I, I spoke with a, a gentleman who, where I park my bus every day, and I said, you know, I want to retire. He said, that's not true. That's not possible. He said, the tourist, tour guides don't retire. They get better at the age. And so, <laughs> so and I told him, well, you know, when people ask me that question, do I, am, I, am I going to tie? I said, well, I got children who need money. <laughs> well, Mr. Brown, we thank you for being on Bounce Around Charleston, sharing with us uh, the history and the stories and letting us know there was a real Porgy oh, and yes. Bess. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right. You heard it right here on Bounce Around Charleston. Hmm. Porgy and Bess. That was a real Porgy and he's a real He's buried at James Allen Testament Church Great God. That's a James Allen. That's me. Okay. Buried. You heard it right here on Bounce Around Charleston. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs> <laughs>